Good afternoon, and welcome to our Getting to the Bottom of Colon Cancer Screening Virtual Discussion, hosted by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, so we thank you for joining us for uh, to discuss this really important and timely topic. I'm Trish higgins Karowski, and I will be your moderator today. We're joined by Dr. Todd Morris and Dr. Amit Jain, both medical oncologists at TMH, where they provide comprehensive and multidisciplinary cancer care for patients in our region. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Today we're talking colons. So among other things, we'll be uh, discussing the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted colon health and why awareness, education, and screenings are so important. Some of you have submitted questions ahead of time, which I'll be sharing with the physicians uh, during this talk. If you have additional questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit them, and I will do my very best to get to them and get you answers in real time. So without further ado, let's get to the bottom of this. They made me say that. Dr. Jane, we hear a lot about how COVID-19 has caused people to delay their regular screenings and, and their regular health care. And I wonder how that has affected cancer patients. Well, certainly um, COVID has affected how we provide cancer care to our patients and community and all over the country. A colon cancer is a cancer that can be caught in early stages with proper screening, which is done in periodic intervals. Uh, because of COVID, uh, many patients and um, family members have been very nervous about going to their stomach doctors and gastroenterologists to get their screenings done. So what we're seeing as a result, is we're seeing a little more uh, incidence of cancers discovered in higher stages or more advanced cancer than what it used to be, which makes it a little bit harder to treat. And uh, it has certainly decreased the diagnosis of cancer in the beginning, but we're seeing a surge as time goes on. And those cancers are more advanced is what you're saying. Unfortunately, because if it's not caught in an early stage, sometimes you catch them at a stage instead of stage one or two, you're catching them more in stage three and four, which is a little bit more challenging to treat. Um, Dr. Morris, how long is a year in the course of the development of a colon cancer? The colon cancers can um, evolve in variable amounts of time. Um, the standard teaching is that a, a colon cancer can uh, develop from a benign polyp and then eventually evolve and develop into a higher grade lesion and then eventually into an invasive carcinoma. In some patients, this can take five to 10 years uh, with slow growing tumors, um, but there is uh, plenty of documentation in the literature of patients who have had clear colonoscopies and certainly within six to 12 months uh, are diagnosed with an invasive carcinoma. Um, so there's high variability, um, but the standard is five to 10 years on average in average risk patients. And that's what lends to most of the guidelines for um, the periodicity or timing of colonoscopy screening. What would you all consider an average risk patient? Well, average risk patient is anybody past the age of 50 um, for certain ethnicities, especially for African-American, they're even considering anybody aged 45 or more is considered a standard risk patient for colon cancer. It is the third most common cancer in both men and women. Uh, patients who have family history of colon cancer and their parents, siblings, or even grandparents are certainly at higher than average risk um, than the average people. Is there, are there things we can, you know, like with, with lung cancer where you don't smoke, you have a better chance of not developing it. Are there things that we do that raise our risk for colon cancer? I think there are certain um, environmental factors that can play a role in the development of colon cancers. Um, there is literature to support um, uh, certain elements that, that you can take in that can increase, such as um, charbroiled meats have been uh, documented as a, a, a potential risk for the development of colon cancer. Um, but we can't say for certain. There are people who live completely healthy lifestyles that avoid um, any potential toxin exposures knowingly, 
that can still develop malignancies. And as such, the screening recommendations are for all comers to have uh, their screening colonoscopy, generally at age 50, like Dr. Jane had mentioned, uh, even average risk, especially in uh, African-American men and women uh, down to the age of 45. Um, certainly for patients with first degree relatives with colon cancer, they're at higher risk. And we generally say screening will start at age 40 or 10 years prior to the age of diagnosis of their first degree family member. Okay, that's good to know. Are there people that can't under, that, we'll get into how the, the screening occurs and, and the whole process, but are there people who can't undergo standard screening for colon cancer? I, I think if we're talking about colonoscopy, I think there are certain conditions that um, they don't prevent, but make uh, any screening procedure. And by definition, a screening procedure should be done in the safest possible manner. Um, so that would limit their access to a screening colonoscopy. So patients with heavy comorbidities, such as um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, decompensated heart failure, um, history of blood clots on blood thinners, those are all medical conditions that would need to be optimized before meeting with a nurse anesthetist and a gastroenterologist to subject somebody to conscious sedation during a colonoscopy. Most colonoscopies are done under conscious sedation. However, in some situations where patients cannot tolerate conscious sedation, there are awake colonoscopies as well. Ooh, <laughs> I'll take the knock me out one if you don't mind. Um, so, but th there are options for people then that couldn't that have these comorbidities, as you say. There are other screening options besides a standard colonoscopy. There's um, capsular colonoscopy, which is a, a pill colonoscopy. There's um, uh, colon CT, um, virtual colonoscopy that's available. Um, and then of course, we'll probably get into talking about fit testing and, um, and then genetic um, stool sampling as well. And, okay, and one all right, and we will, I promise. I'm sorry, and one of the most common and simple tests they can see uh, people can do with just their primary care providers is annual stool testing for any blood, because one of the most common sign or symptom of colon cancer is bleeding, which may or may not be visible to our eyes. So there is microscopic blood loss in the stools that can be tested with a very simple, very quick and dirty test, you know, which can be done every year. And you just ask your doctor for that test. You can ask your doctor and some many doctors recommend it on their own if the patients are not able to do colonoscopy or are unwilling to do colonoscopy or if their resources are limited, it is absolutely you know, something they can ask their doctor. Okay, I wanna back up for just a second here and just uh, address the, the people who have been putting this off for the past year. Cause you know, it's not hard to come up with an excuse to delay your first colonoscopy, let's face it. But um, people have been using COVID or been saying they're afraid to go into the doctor's office because they don't want to get COVID. So what do you each say to your patients who are delaying this screening process because of COVID? I mean, reality, the, the risk of getting um, COVID is, is there and the risk of dying from COVID-19 is there. That does not and negate the risk of getting other cancers and other health problems and things that people are naturally at risk for as we are get older. And we also tell our patients that all the gastroenterology offices and the digestive doctors are taking due diligence in making sure that they're safe and sanitary and healthy environment to reduce, mitigate the risk of COVID-19 as much as possible. And we, we cannot forget and um, forego other diseases which are continuing to affect lives of people. People are continuing to catch and get colon cancer and die from it. So we have to be aware that other diseases are not going to stop occurring because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I, th Moore? I, think, I think early in the pandemic, there were probably some um, difficulties in scheduling colonoscopies um, from, the, from, the, from the medical physical plant standpoint. Um, hospitals may have been at capacity, um, eliminating elective procedures. Um, offices were just learning how to mitigate the situation. So there was less availability for appointments, both in clinic and as well as in the procedural suites. 
Um, we are a year into this, and most institutions have become very facile with risk mitigation strategies. And um, although they may not be providing the procedures at the same rate as they were two years ago, there is an appropriate availability. Um, and as such, that should not be used as uh, an excuse not to pursue that. Um, there's always fear in cancer screening, both of the procedure, especially an invasive procedure like a colonoscopy, as well as the um, discomfort associated with the bowel prep for the colonoscopy. Um, and then there's also kind of the undiscussed uh, anxiety, stress, and fear of what if they find something. And these are generally the roadblocks that prevent people from really seeking out cancer screening in general. And our patient population in the cancer center is a little different than in a standard primary care clinic because most of our patients already have a diagnosis of cancer. And so they're a little bit more accustomed to the discussion of um, high risk scenarios and cancer diagnoses. Um, whereas in a primary clinic where you may be discussing with uh, somebody who just turned age 50, who has no other comorbidities or health problems, the idea of going in and doing something that's invasive and potentially um, identifying a life-changing diagnosis, um, there may be some hesitancy there to do that. And that's understandable. Right. Okay, we have a question from our, one of our participants uh, I wanna get to. Are those other testing options covered under insurance? So we were talking about the, uh, other than the colonoscopy, other ways to test for colon cancer. Dr. J? Well, um, the, the stool testing that I mentioned, that is certainly covered by all insurances. It's, like I said, it's a very quick and simple test. For other testing, it can be varied by different insurance, and it can also need a referral from the from the primary care doctor or from the gastroenterologist specifying why certain patient can or cannot do a colonoscopy or why another test would be recommended. But uh, the gist of it is to, if you see something in other tests, a colonoscopy is still needed to prove there is a cancer or not. All other tests will show things which will still lead to colonoscopy. So they are covered by insurances with uh, you know, specific recommendations for somebody who cannot do it. I'm sure everybody has seen the commercials for Cologuard, I think it's called, um, which looks like a painless, they, you know, painless way to find out if you have colon cancer. Um, what's the deal with that? So, I mean, I think home testing is always very attractive for, for patients and Cologuard is a, um, it's a home stool study um, that's looking for specific molecular cells with specific molecular abnormalities consistent with um, a potential colon cancer. And I say a potential colon cancer. Um, it's um, different than FIT testing or stool guaiac testing, which are also stool sample testing in that it's actually looking for DNA changes um, in cells in the stool. Um, as Dr. Jane mentioned, all of these tests are part of a two-step process in colon screening, specifically that if you have a positive fit test, stool guaiac test, or uh, stool genetic analysis, um, then positive meaning concerns for a potential cancer, then the recommendation would be to move on to the next step, which would be colonoscopy. For so all roads eventually lead to the colonoscopy. We might as well just accept that, right? With a positive, with a with a positive um, screening pre-screening test, yes, that would be the recommendation. But you wouldn't recommend that someone. I mean, you would, you would not. You would you would not recommend a person use Cologuard at the age of fifty rather than going in for their first screening. We well, any screening test is better than none. Okay. So if all they would be willing to take is a Cologuard test, I would take that over not having any testing at all. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, Dr. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, our recommendation is, still stands for colonoscopy. This is for somebody who is unwilling or unable to do colonoscopy. Right. Okay. All right. Let's get into the signs and symptoms that might cause a person to go to their doctor and, and say, I might need a colonoscopy. Um, what should individuals be aware of and how would they know that they need to be checked by a physician? 
Well, the most common symptoms, signs and symptoms of colon cancer are blood loss from the colon cancer, which can be microscopic, may or may not be visible. So it could be a discoloration of the stool and changes in bowel habits. So frequent diarrhea or constipation or alternating either one of them. In more advanced cases, we can see weight loss, sometimes abdominal pain. Some folks can have difficulty eating and they're losing weight. Nausea and vomiting rarely can happen as well. Um, some patients, we see them as being weak and tired because that's a sign of anemia, which is blood loss from the colon cancer. So signs and symptoms of low blood counts, fatigue, tiredness, shortness of breath should lead to check for um, blood loss in the intestines. And most of this would be in patients who are in the 45 to 50 range. Is that right? 45 to 50 and older. Okay. Well, of course. Yes. Sorry. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the risk factors, but is there anything that I can do as, as a person who's in the uh, 60 plus range to reduce the risk of developing these polyps? Well, um, there is definitely some some studies and, and um, guidelines about having um, obesity associated with colon cancer. There is some vague studies about uh, red meat consumption with risk for colon cancer, but nothing has been really proven with a very solid scientific evidence for us to give guidelines and recommendations. There have been studies with a low-dose aspirin, certain supplements, but then there have been studies that have not proven the same thing. So the, the jury is still out there about what health-wise lifestyle changes we can do. You know, my recommendations to my family and friends is, you know, eating healthy, doing exercise, staying fit. If and when they do develop any cancer, they will be in a good shape and health to take a surgery and get their colonoscopy and get their treatments. That's a good point. Dr. Morris, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I was gonna, I'll just echo the, 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 um, the, the data on aspirin, I think is not, um, is not 100% uh, endorsed across the board, um, but certainly there's good literature out there for taking a low dose aspirin. Um, I also wanna just make sure that um, we discuss that, that those lifestyle changes shouldn't happen when you're, in si when you're 60. Um, you know, starting out uh, in your early adult years and maintaining healthy lifestyle is what's going to reduce the risk long term um, for the production of these malignancies. The incident rate of incidence rate of colon cancer has actually gone down over the last four decades. Since the 1980s, um, in patients greater than age 60, we've seen a steady decline in the incidence, and I think that's um, in part because um, we're doing um, appropriate. Um, early colon cancer screening in people. So we're finding colon cancers sooner. Um, and also, I think people are just more um, uh, willing to discuss screening and cancer with their primary care doctors and do the right things to reduce the risk of, of colon cancer in general. Okay. Well, we have a quick question from someone uh, watching. Are some of the fecal occult tests better than others? So um, historically, we used fecal occult blood testing, which um, is a nonspecific test, which looks for any, basically any iron containing elements within the stool. Fit testing is a more specific test, which is not based on um, if somebody is taking a, an iron supplement or um, is eating iron rich foods, it's looking really for hemoglobin. So fit testing is considered superior to fecal occult blood testing, which is different than the genetic testing that we had talked about previously. So when Dr. Jane was talking about annual um, stool testing, um, the, the test that is generally recommended in the primary clinic for yearly testing is actually fit testing. Okay. But now you say yearly testing. Um, generally speaking, people don't have to get colonoscopies every year, like for instance, mammograms. You got to get in a mammogram every year. Not not so with colonoscopies. Correct. No, the, the the screening recommendations for colonoscopies will be determined by you and your gastroenterologist. But at minimum, the recommendation is at age 50, starting every 10 years. Um, and certain populations will have screening recommendations for every five years. And some patient populations at higher risk can undergo yearly um, screening. 
and um, and testing. <laughs> yeah, and, um, I, know, but, I know that. Um, but fit testing is is different than colonoscopy because it's non-invasive and it's something that can be easily ordered and it gives a lot of confidence and reassurance to both the patient and the physician in the five or 10 year interval where invasive testing is not gonna be recommended. Uh, we've been told that, um, that if you have the COVID-19 vaccine, you need to wait on your mammogram. I'm not sure why, but is that, does that factor into the uh, colonoscopy procedure too, Dr. Jane? I mean, I think uh, the COVID-19 vaccine can have some mild adverse effects that can last for 24 to 48 hours. So um, other than that, the, the COVID-19 vaccine should not have any impact on a colon cancer screening. Uh, in case of mammogram, the, the one point was some folks who got COVID-19 vaccine had some swollen lymph nodes in their neck or in their underarm area. So that could lead some a misdiagnosis of a breast cancer. And okay. that's why mammogram was recommended a few days apart, uh, not so much for a colon cancer screening. Okay. Um, all right. We need to get into uh, the weeds here. Let's talk about what happens when a person is told they have to have a colonoscopy. And I'll let either one of you start us off. Um, so, um, okay. so for colonoscopy, if a patient is recommended to have a colonoscopy, they usually meet with a, <clears throat> they're referred over to a gastroenterologist who is the subspecialist who performs the colonoscopies. And uh, they meet with them, they have a consultation with them in their office. They're explaining the details of the procedure and then they fix up a date uh, for scheduling the first colonoscopy. Usually for colonoscopies, there is a, a thing called bowel preparation. You have to get the colon clean for the gastroenterologist to be able to put his camera in a scope and look for small polyps and look for cancers. So which can be a two to three day process. It would require taking some laxatives, so clearing out the bowels, and then there is um, a special uh, medicine or a, it's a, called go lightly. Uh, there is a laxative that you take for 24 to 48 hours until you get clear watery stool. So that means the colon is clear, avoid eating too much food during that time, preferably liquid diet. And it's all given written instructions to the patients in detail. And then they do that over the 24 to 48 hours, they come in for their colonoscopy, um, about 30 to 45 minutes procedure. And then they go home, the results are usually available a few days later and the gastroenterologist will reach out to the patient or their family to inform of the results. And let's be honest, I mean, I have a lot of, I'm a, I'm a human polyp farm, okay? I have some bizarre gene, but I've been through this many, many times. And so I have a lot of friends who say, I, I, I don't wanna go through the prep the prep is the worst. So I'd like to kind of dispel some of the, the myths about the prep process. And Dr. Morris, I know you, you mentioned to me that you have been through the prep process um, along. You, you're a member of the club. So, so, um, so it's, <laughs> it's not an enjoyable period of time, but um, it's, all, it's all relative and it's all based on perspective. And this goes back to kind of what I was talking about before, you know, our patient population here in the cancer center versus, you know, a relatively healthy person who has not been involved in the medical community, something that we look at as, oh, this is like no big deal, right? It's a bowel prep. Some other people would look at as being a major inconvenience and a hardship. Um, and again, it's about perspective. But the reality is the bowel prep, you know, you drink stuff that tastes terrible generally, and you have to hang out at home close to a toilet for, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours while that medicine works through the system. And um, it's not a painful thing. It's just, it's very inconvenient and, um, and not a, an enjoyable, enjoyable day. And I totally get that, but it's very important um, because the, the, the better the bowel prep, the better the, the sensitivity of the study. And ultimately that's what you want. If you're gonna go through the, the process of undergoing an invasive screening test, you want it to be as sensitive as possible, meaning being able to detect even the smallest polyps. Um, and the cleaner the bowel, the better the sensitivity. Well, um, my experience is that uh, the day before, you know, you drink the stuff early in the morning, 
nasty stuff and then you get your little area prepared have your reading material in that bathroom um, have pedialyte pops those are those are a good clear liquid not the red or the orange but the blue the green and the purple um, ready and you drink that stuff cold ice cold it makes it easier to go down um, I think it's variable for everybody, but definitely I think you're hitting on a key point is as you are, as you are drinking these, um, these preparations, um, you do need to make sure that you're maintaining an appropriate hydration state. Um, these, all these um, laxatives do have high salt concentrations and will draw water out of your system. And so staying hydrated is, is, is very important. And uh, in general, when you get to the gastroenterologist, they're going to put an IV in you. They're usually going to start some IV fluids before the procedure, before they give you your, you know, Versed and fentanyl and make sure that you're hemodynamically in a good place before um, providing you conscious sedation. Mm -hmm. And the day before you're, you're really, I mean, this is what you're focused on for a good reason. This can save your life. So all right, you got to drink some bad stuff, some nasty tasting stuff, and it's really not all that bad. Think of it as a cleanse, <laughs> you know? I mean, your colon's going to be whistle clean when you get through this thing. Some, some people really pay to do this, you know, colonics is a thing. <laughs> um, well, um, let's talk about what you can and cannot eat or drink on the day before. So well, generally, they want the the gastroenter gastroenterologist will talk about low residue um, diet. So um, stuff that's that's going to be easily digestible and cleared from the system. Liquid diets. Um, you're not going to want to go out and eat a you know a porterhouse steak. And uh, I didn't even know that was an option. Yeah, not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Good option. Um, clear liquids, correct? Preferably clear liquids, you know, to again avoid anything that was a lot of color that could <clears throat> map what they're looking at with the colonoscopy. So clear liquids and like Dr. Morris says, staying hydrated is important. So you don't want to like not eat or drink anything at all in the attempt to not clear the bowels and just keeping hydrated with clear liquids. Clear liquids can include uh, water, um, light juice, um, Gatorades, things like that that are um, just easily digestible. It's all water. Um, it not, was, not vodka, gin, white wine. Uh, I might avoid that for that weekend and hold on for the next weekend for that. <laughs> okay. We That's have a question. A drink after your colonoscopy. Yeah, exactly. The, it's the reward. <laughs> um, af, okay. We have a question from the participants. Is the Go Lightly solution the only way to prep for a colonoscopy? No. Um, most gastroenterologists have their favorite cocktails of how they cleanse the bowel. And the go light prep is only one potential option, um, but the 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 each gastroenterologist has their own kind of favorite cocktail that they'll provide that has provided good results, and uh, and they'll make the recommendation on on how to do that and what is they think is best um, in your in each individual situation. Um, of course, they'll also look at your comorbidities and your other medications to help determine um, what may or may not be appropriate in that situation. Okay, so on the day before, you, you, you need to make sure that you are drinking the whole solution, whatever it is they give you, mm -hmm. clear liquids, and um, stay off of any solid foods or anything that might uh, be, well, just clear liquids, right? And stay close to home. And don't, stay don't, don't do this at work. Yes. <laughs> Stock <laughs> that bathroom with your favorite magazines because you're going to spend some time in there. And I will, I also have something else I want to add to this. Boudreaux's butt paste. Apply it before the fun begins. I'm a cyclist, so I know about these things. Right. Um, but it kind of makes the go a little easier. All right. So let's now move on to the day of. Um, you've, you've done your prep. You are ready to have this thing over with. Hopefully you've got an early morning appointment so you don't get that caffeine withdrawal headache. What happens when they come in? Well, the gastroenterologist office, it, they are, that's primary thing they do is colonoscopies and endoscopies. So they have usually an endoscopy suite, um, which is within their office. Sometimes it's done at the, at, uh, the hospitals, uh, which is a little bit different setting, but 90% of the times it's done in their office. So they come to their clinic 
Um, and uh, just like for any other procedure, like you go for a dermatology procedure or an eye procedure, they have the proper check-ins. You come in, uh, they take you into certain sewage, the nurse will explain the procedure in detail again. Um, and the doctor usually comes by and says, hi, make sure they're doing okay. Usually there is no blood testing required. There is um, nothing change in the medications. Each patient might be given some recommendations about a change in their medications. If they're on a blood thinner, they might need to hold it that morning or the day before. If they're on a blood pressure medication, maybe hold that one or a diabetes medicine. So they will be given individual instructions and then they're taken down to the suite. And um, um, we as oncologists are not exactly aware how the procedure and how their suits are done, but I would imagine you, you're in a, in a, in a suite, there's a nurse and there's a doctor comes in here, talks about it really quickly. And, you know, before you know it, you wake up and you're like, okay, time to go home. I'm always amazed at that. You think that, I mean, you literally close your eyes and when you wake up, it's over. And, and it seems like you you've been down for about five seconds. Yeah, for, for most people, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, that's what conscious sedation is. As Dr. Morris said, you can do it awake, but conscious sedation puts you into this, this very mild sleep. You're not requiring a breathing machine or apparatus, or um, you're just kind of laying sleeping with a couple of medications they can give you that last in the body for 30 minutes to an hour, a little bit longer. And, and oftentimes, the they'll, they'll get. Go ahead. oftentimes they'll give a medication um, such as Versed that can actually cause some retrograde amnesia. So, so even if you do wake up during the procedure, um, the, the, those medications will uh, allow you to not remember anything that was happening during the procedure. <laughs> I like that. I would not want to remember that either. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was just dreaming. Um, okay, I want to talk about how prevalent colon cancer is in our community here. Yeah, I, I think we can start off by saying how prevalent it is in the United States. It is, as Dr. Jane had mentioned earlier today, it's the, the third most prevalent malignancy in the United States. Um, and uh, in, in our community, um, when you look at our statistics over the last couple of years, um, we reviewed our registry data here just a week or so ago. Um, there's approximately um, 90 to 120 cases that we see here at Tallahassee Memorial Cancer Center um, on an annual basis, on average. Um, and that includes colon cancer and rectal cancer. Um, so it's, it's, it is a more common malignancy. It's something that uh, we will see new patients quite frequently here at TMHCC. And, um, and, and it's, it, as I said, it is the, it's the third most prevalent cancer in the United States. The good thing is that um, even though the incidence of colon cancer has gone down over the last four decades in patients older, older than age 60, um, the other important fact of that is that the distribution of staging of the cancer has changed over the last four decades as well. Through, what does that mean? Er, through early screening, we're finding more and more patients diagnosed at an earlier stage. So stage one or stage two, where those patients can be treated with surgery alone versus stage three, which would require additional chemotherapy or stage four, which would be non-curable malignancy. Um, so we're seeing, um, we're seeing less people over the age of 60 being diagnosed um, and at earlier stages. Now, along those same lines, we're seeing more patients diagnosed before the age of 50, and that's because we have better screening programs. Those patients would often have waited until they were over the age of 50 and maybe diagnosed at a much later stage. So we're finding patients earlier, we're finding patients younger, and we're being and we're able and as such through um, through multimodality care able to cure a higher percentage of patients with colon cancer. What is the treatment for early stage colon cancer? So for early, go ahead, Amit. You go ahead, Dr. Morris. So for early stage colon cancer, stage um, stage one or stage two. Um, it is surgery for colon cancer. It's different for rectal cancer. For colon cancer, it's, it is surgery followed by in, intensive monitoring for five years um, to, to ensure that the, the, the cancer does not recur, um, both locally within the colon 
um, as well as um, distant recurrence to the liver, the bone, the lung, someplace um, uh, distant from the primary cancer site. For stage three colon cancer, which is colon cancer that is invaded through the wall of the colon and metastasized to the regional lymph nodes, the lymph nodes that are around the colon itself, it is often recommended that those patients who have low comor comorbid state and can handle adjuvant or after surgery chemotherapy would undergo up to six months of chemotherapy following recovery from surgery. Stage four colon cancer sometimes involves surgery, uh, most often involves chemotherapy alone. Okay, question from the audience. Um, as you see colon cancer cases being top three, does this correlate to a rise in stomach cancers or do they not relate? Well, they're technically not related because uh, the way the colon cancer presents and how the stomach cancer, or the, even though they are part of the same digestive system, they're actually classified extremely differently. Uh, stomach cancer are extremely rare compared to colon cancer, seen in certain patient population a lot more than colon cancer. So it's probably um, in, the, in the top 10 cancers incidence, but still quite lower than the colon cancer. The treatments are extremely different. A colonoscopy is not a test that would detect stomach cancer. So we're not seeing any correlation between stomach cancer or colon cancer incidence. Okay, that's good to know. Um, all right, another question here. Uh, is there genetic testing available to individuals on top of colonoscopies? That's actually a very, very interesting question. And it's a point of discussion because uh, similar to breast cancers, there have been some uh, hereditary predispositions that have been discovered that increase tendencies to form colon cancer at a younger age in certain families. So we do recommend that anybody who is diagnosed with colon cancer have a full family history reviewed. If they do have more than one or two family members with colon cancer, then there are specific genetic testing that we recommend. Um, and even if they do not have any family history, if they are considered a little bit of an oddball, somebody relatively younger, somebody who has more advanced colon cancer that you would expect, then we recommend doing some genetic testing not just for them, but also their other family members, their children, siblings, so we can give them recommendations. But genetic testing by itself is not screening test for colon cancer, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. It is done for somebody who either had family history of colon cancer or they themselves have colon cancer. When I was 46 is when they discovered my condition and I have four brothers and they said out of your four brothers, at least one is going to have colon cancer. And sure enough, that was the case. Um, I was sent for genetic testing and I thought it was very useful. Um, but I, I see your point that if, if someone in your family has colon cancer, the, the red flags should go up for everybody, right? And then the screening recommendations and screening guidelines technically are different and will be individualized. As Dr. Morris said earlier, you recommend to do a colonoscopy 10 years younger to when their family member had the colon cancer. So for example, if their father had a colon cancer at 48, we would recommend a colonoscopy at the age of 38 for that person. Okay, wow. Um, Question from the audience, where should I go to get a colonoscopy? Primary care, where? So um, you should first discuss the, the screening process with your primary care physician who will place a consultation um, as appropriate to a regional gastroenterologist. Um, so the, the right place to start is um, with your family doctor. Okay. Um, it looks like we are, unless we have some more questions, uh, we are coming to the end here. So I'd like to give both of you an opportunity to, um, to talk about what the most important message is you want people to take away from our discussion today. And we'll start with you, Dr. Jane. So, I mean, uh, you know, the thing that I would like to bring to attention that cancer is not, has not stopped occurring. People have continue to get cancers. People have continued to die from cancers. There are great treatments available for all different kinds of cancers. The cancer research is upcoming and booming beyond we could keep up with. And the trick and the key is to get appropriate testing, watch your body, take care of your health, 
follow your doctor's recommendations and not afraid of COVID-19 as the only health problem that exists in America. All the other diseases, all the other cancers are equally important and have not gone away. We wish that COVID-19, all the cancers would disappear, but that has not happened. So my recommendation for you know healthy pa pa population and general people is to just make sure you are appropriate for any cancers that could be prevented and some things are unforeseeable, uh, but the ones that are, and there are testing available, uh, talk to your doctor, be open-minded, ask all the questions necessary, understand the pros and cons and when you need it, if you need it, and how often you need those testing done. So if there is a cancer that you can catch it early enough that you may not need any big surgery ever. Good advice. How about you, Dr. Morris? Yeah, I echo those same um, messages. You know, a screening test is not just an exercise in futility. Um, it is important to, to follow with your primary physician um, and follow along on all of the preventive service task force recommendations for screenings independent of COVID. These um, screening tests are designed and uh, backed by science to determine the best way to reduce your risk of being diagnosed with an advanced cancer. And um, I would much prefer A, to never meet you in my clinic, or B, if I do have a conversation where I say your cancer is such an early cancer, it doesn't require any chemotherapeutics versus the alternative, which is patients coming in with very advanced malignancies, metastatic outside of the region of, of origination with, um, with certain death, uh, eventual death associated with their malignancy. So do your screening tests. Please get to your doctors. Don't let COVID be a barrier. Um, and also, will you remind, remind us what the treatment options are if you do get a diagnosis, if for whatever reason of cancer, colon cancer, what are the treatment options again? So for, um, so for early stage disease is uh, partial colectomy, which is a surgical resection of a portion of colon that is uh, affected by the cancer itself along with regional lymph node removal um, for uh, stage three colon cancer. Um, we would add on adjuvant chemotherapy, which is means chemotherapy after you heal from surgery for six months where you receive chemotherapy for up to six months where you receive chemotherapy every two weeks um, for a six month period. And for stage four, you may require some surgery if there's an obstruction or significant bleeding, but generally is chemotherapy designed to control the cancer but not cure the cancer. For rectal cancer, which we haven't talked a lot about today, it's treated a little bit differently in that we generally recommend before surgery undergoing radiation with chemotherapy simultaneously, followed by surgery, followed by additional chemotherapy. So um, for more advanced um, lymph node positive um, rectal cancers. So, um, so a little bit of variation between colon cancer and rectal cancer is the addition of radiation. Um, but for early stage diseases, whether it's rectal cancer or colon cancer, it's surgery and surgery alone for curative intent. Dr. Jane, did you wanna add something there? Oh, I, I completely agree with everything okay. that Morris said. You know, chemotherapy, and surgery are the two main options. Um, a couple of things I just wanna add, there are a lot of, like I said, advances in cancer treatment. So there is immunotherapy that is the that is a talk of the time all the time for a lot of different cancers. In a handful of colon cancer patients, immunotherapy can also be an option for them. It is carefully screened patients with certain genetic features in their cancer. We have been able to use uh, immunotherapy for their cancers. Wow. So we have a lot of treatment options if, in fact, you do come home with this diagnosis. And there's nothing to fear in the prep. So everybody out there who's been putting it off because they don't want to do the prep, it's not that hard. Trust me. If it was, I wouldn't be able to do it. OK, um, we are uh, we have to wrap it up here. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Morris and Dr. Jane. I know you guys are busy and I appreciate you taking the time to participate in our discussion. Thanks for having us, Trish. Yep, happy to do that anytime. If you are, oh, I wanna thank, let me, let me thank the folks who uh, had questions, who submitted questions and for everybody who was watching. And if you're interested in learning more about cancer services available at Tallahassee Memorial, please visit tmh.org slash cancer. 
And anyone who'd like to learn more about the COVID-19 response in our community, we invite you to join us for our weekly panel discussion on Fridays called State of COVID-19 in Leon County. You can register for that at tmh.org slash COVID talk. We hope you guys have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.